let's jump in here unless there are any questions. I'm going to kind of review what we talked about a little bit and then I'm going to try to talk about um, a portion of uh, the homeostatic uh, regulation of this glomerul glomerular filtration rate. I get my tongue to work on a Friday morning. Um, I'm not going to hit all parts of it. I'm not going to be able to hit all parts of it as it relates to uh, water, uh, sodium, and potassium homeostasis. Uh, but I'll get the I'll get the big chunks. So, um, all right. There are, there are three basic mechanisms uh, that we use. So la last time, I should say before I jump in, I'll uh, remind you uh, that the glomerulus is this knot of capillaries uh, that is the primary functional unit in the nephron. Um, blood comes in via uh, the afferent arteriole, uh, which I can't tell which it is in this diagram. I'll just say it's this one. Comes in here, passes through these capillaries that are fenestrated, have uh, slits in them, and uh, the water and any uh, solutes that are smaller than the diameter of those slits are able to pass out into what we call the tubular fluid. And this is the fluid that is going to be amended uh, in various ways to become urine uh, for eventual excretion and elimination. Um, and then that blood leaves the glomerulus uh, via the uh, efferent arterial. I talked about how uh, the blood pressure, so this glomerulus is particularly sensitive uh, to changes in blood pressure and consequently has an important role, uh, the nephron itself has an important role in helping to regulate uh, blood pressure. All right, and so we're going to talk about how uh, glomerular filtration rate uh, is controlled and then how that relates to uh, blood pressure homeostasis. The three mechanisms uh, are autoregulation. Um, this, is, this is happening uh, sort of in situ uh, with the use of uh, paracrine uh, regulation of, um, of mesangial cells. Then there's going to be uh, an endocrine uh, function, uh, hormonal regulation, that is initiated by the kidney, but which goes systemically and causes a cascade of uh, events that are going to involve multiple organs, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then finally, uh, the third method, uh, I'll, I'll talk the most about this method right here. Uh, and then the, the third method of, of controlling uh, the GFR is uh, via sympathetic autonomic uh, input. All right. So one of the principal uh, actors in this, in initiating the, uh, in these cascades, is what we call the juxtaglomerular complex. And these are a, uh, an aggregate of a couple different cell types uh, taken together. It's an endocrine structure that's going to uh, secrete a number of hormones that have various effects. Uh, one of those hormones is uh, erythropoietin. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, except uh, to say that it simply stimulates erythropoiesis when renal oxygen levels drop. Um, so this is sensitive to, uh, to uh, oxygen delivery at uh, the capillary bed of the glomerulus when uh, that oxygen level drops too low then uh, it helps to stimulate erythropoiesis. What is erythropoiesis? What does that word mean? So uh, the first, the prefix there, erythro, you've heard that this semester. Uh, where have I used that word before? Erythrocytes. Erythrocytes, and what is an erythrocyte? Red blood cell. A red blood cell. So erythropoiesis is simply the production of red blood cells, all right? Uh, erythropoietin is the hormone that begins the process of red blood cell production, uh, and it's uh, what helps your hematocrit to go uh, 
up if it's if it's low. So uh, if you have a decreased uh, renal O2 level, um, then you'll make more red blood cells. Uh, and then another hormone that's really important here is called renin. And uh, I'm the, I'll give you the very broad overview of renin just by saying renin is there to elevate your blood pressure. Okay. Um, and it, it's going to, we're going to talk quite a bit about how it does that. Uh, it's through a, a complicated uh, process. Let me, first of all, just talk a little bit about the anatomy of the juxtaglomerular process uh, the complex. So the afferent arterial brings blood into the glomerulus, efferent brings it out. Here's the capsular space, here's the urinary pole, tubular fluid coming out, right? We've got that. This tube goes into the proximal convoluted tubule down the loop of Henle back up to the distal convoluted tubule before passing into the collecting duct. You remember all that from last time? Well, the distal convoluted tubule, before it passes uh, into the collecting duct, which is aggregating tubular fluid from many nephrons, before it, it joins with others, it passes, a loop of it passes back by the uh, renal corpuscle, back by the glomerulus. And there is, uh, at this junction point right here, is this aggregate of endocrine structures, endocrine cells, uh, that we call the juxtaglomerular complex. So uh, roughly speaking, there are two regions to the uh, juxtaglomerular complex. There is uh, the macula densa, uh, we've heard, come across the word macula before. What did I tell you macula meant? What's that? Big. big? Uh, it's not, not actually big. It, it is, it's related to the word, like macro is what you're thinking. Uh, I, I used the word magno when I was talking about uh, the ganglion cells in the eye. But no, uh, macula is in the eye, so you are thinking back to the right chapter. Uh, the macula is that spot uh, in, at, at the center of your focus that has the fovea in it, which is the actual center. So a macula is just a, a round patch of, of cells. It's sort of a patch of cells uh, whenever you hear. And there was also the macula in the, uh, the utricle and saccule, if you remember there as well. And that's also a patch of hair cells that is in those structures. It's just an, an aggregate, a round aggregate of cells, a patch of cells. The macula densa, and so called, so called densa because the cells are packed uh, more tightly in uh, this macula. And that is within the wall of the distal convoluted tubule. They interact uh, with what we call the juxtaglomerular cells. The juxtaglomerular cells, these are endocrine cells uh, who are going to uh, be secreting um, products hormones into the bloodstream, and specifically renin. So these uh, two cell types together form the uh, juxtaglomerular complex. All right, so now here is a little uh, bit of detail about uh, autoregulation. Um, uh, we were going through the three uh, methods of, of control of GFR. There was autoregulation, there was hormonal regulation, systemic endocrine, and then uh, sympathetic autonomics. So we'll start uh, here. Um, homeostasis starts with normal uh, glomerular function. Uh, if there is reduced uh, glomerular filtration rate uh, before whatever reason the blood pressure has gone down a little bit, uh, we're going to get a, a decreased filtrate and decreased urine production. Um, this is going to result in uh, three uh, in situ effects. First of all, the afferent arterial is going to dilate, uh, and that's going to allow more blood to come in, or more importantly, uh, that's going to increase the pressure differential between the, uh, the afferent and efferent. Uh, this is similar to the concept of preload and afterload in the heart. Um, and then uh, on the other side of that 
you're going to get constriction of the efferent arterioles. So this is uh, the, the, um, the contrapositive of dilating the uh, afferent arterioles. And then the third effect is the contraction of the mesangial cells, which is going to actually uh, tighten the diameter of the capillaries within the glomerulus. All right? Um, all three of those things are going to lead to an increased blood pressure, uh, an increased effective blood pressure in the glomerulus. Yeah? So the mesangial cells, those were the fingered cells that no, are... Which no, let me remind you. Um, so there were the, the capillary knot uh, made of the epithelial cells, uh, the endothelial cells uh, for the um, glomerulus. They were covered in podocytes, which are the cells that you're thinking of. That is part of the, the uh, visceral epithelium. And then mesangial cells were uh, cells that intercalated themselves. Uh, let's see if I can get a picture. Here we go. Uh, that intercalated themselves between uh, adjacent uh, capillaries. They contracted, and when they did that, when they do that, they sort of narrow uh, the diameter. They constrict the diameter of the uh, capillaries right inside the glomerulus. All right. Okay, so they're not really shown in the... No, not at all. They're taking this section so they can show you in between, but they're not actually depicted in this diagram here. <clears throat> all right, is that, is that clear? We've got the endothelium, the visceral epithelium in terms of podocytes with the pedicels, the little fingers, and then uh, in between them we have the mesangial cells, which help to constrict the uh, diameter of those capillaries. Where are we? All right, and so uh, that's going to uh, increase the glomerular blood pressure. That's just in the nephron, in that specific nephron. This has nothing to do with blood pressure uh, in the, in systemically. Um, it's just autoregulation, in situ autoregulation. If that's enough, uh, if that is sufficient, then homeostasis has been restored because uh, we have a GFR that, we're, that uh, is part of the set point for the kidney and uh, we're, we're back to where we want to be. So uh, how much work do your kidneys do for you? Well, uh, about 125 milliliters per minute. That is 180 liters per day. That's a lot to me. Um, I, I, think that's, I think that's a lot. That's like, what, nearly 50 gallons or something like that? That's a barrel. It's one of those big barrels of, uh, of filtrate. Uh, but, of course, you don't have that much fluid in your body, right? You would be uh, dehydrated and dead within a couple hours um, if that wasn't uh, mostly resorbed. Um, all right. So of... Uh, the fluid that does enter the kidneys, 10% of that fluid uh, is actually leaving the bloodstream into the capsular space. So you can, uh, from those two numbers, you could even calculate uh, the you could calculate the amount of blood flowing through the kidneys, and even uh, the estimate of what your cardiac output would have to be, given that uh, we said about a fourth or a fifth of your cardiac output is flowing through your kidneys. All right. So negative feedback here. When we have a higher GFR, um, there's going to be a, a rapid uh, efflux of uh, filtrate uh, in the renal tubules. This, the macula densa that I had uh, indicated earlier in the duct glomerular complex is going to recognize that, is going to secrete various paracrine factors uh, that will have the opposite effect of what I just showed in the previous slide. It's going to contract. Uh, the afferent AT, uh, arterial. Instead of dilating it, it's going to contract it. So uh, reduce the incoming blood pressure and then uh, give us the reduced glomerular filtration rate. So there's both a positive uh, and a negative feedback loop uh, in terms of auto-regulation. Is this good? You got this? Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to begin to talk about the endocrine uh, part of the equation here, uh, the systemic regulation of glomerular filtration rate, and, the, and how this plays into 
uh, blood pressure control, and specifically uh, sodium, potassium, and water homeostasis. Now, here's just a list. Uh, some of you, I don't remember, actually, someone is not here right now, but uh, someone had told me that they don't like all these pictures. They like lists, and they like lots of text, and uh, here's some text for you. Um, so the, I, the two important columns here are the major hormones and then the important enzymes uh, that are, are going to be uh, characters in the story. There are, there's a long list of minor hormones that I certainly don't have time in this lecture to cover in depth. Um, I will, there is one slide where I think I will mention most of these, uh, but only passingly. Uh, but the important ones that, that you need to know are uh, highlighted there. And we're going to go through uh, the story of these uh, one at a time. So we've already mentioned renin as a critical enzyme, and we'll see what uh, renin does in a moment. Its effect is on uh, an angiotensinogen, which is a, the uh, pro-hormone of angiotensin uh, 1 and 2. Uh, and then angiotensin converting enzyme is the other critical enzyme that helps uh, angiotensin 1 get to angiotensin 2. So we'll see how that works in a couple slides. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, the processes of homeostasis for uh, these uh, cationic electrolytes and water um, involve these four uh, systems or three systems and one sort of abstract, a little bit more abstract concept. Uh, the first I'll mention is the GI system. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth at all here because, in fact, uh, there's not much to say about the GI system, its role in this, unless you start talking about pathology. Um, and I'm not going to. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, essentially, there is absorption of water, potassium, and sodium through the GI tract, and there is some secretion. And in general, you're absorbing more than you are secreting. Um, so anything that is leaving the body, any fluid that's leaving the body via the renal system uh, is going to have to be absorbed here. All right? um, and then the second is, of course, the renal system. So uh, the renal system is going to be filtrating uh, the blood and by so doing, uh, fluid, water, and these cations are going to be leaving the bloodstream. But the kidneys are also going to be resorbing a, a significant amount of uh, the water, uh, sodium, and potassium uh, that was originally filtrated. Um, and then there is the endocrine system, uh, which is at uh, the top of the pyramid in terms of um, the systemic control. We have uh, the hypothalamus, uh, the, the pituitary and the adrenal gland, and that's going to form what's called uh, the HPA axis, the, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis. So I'll talk about that uh, just a little bit uh, here today. That's actually not going to be the most important. Uh, I'm not going to emphasize that. I shouldn't say it's uh, any less important than the, the RA axis, but uh, I'm not going to emphasize it as much. Um, and then uh, the last concept in terms of uh, homeostasis for sodium potassium is uh, the intracellular space. And uh, this is an abstract concept in terms of all of the fluid and ions that exist within all of your cells, right? And there is transfer, there is exchange uh, from the intracellular space into the extracellular space, which is then in exchange with the blood and passes into the kidneys, etc. All right, um, and we there there are control mechanisms in terms of the homeostasis that uh, take place on uh, the transmembrane uh, level of of all your cells. All right, that are going to uh, help control the level of potassium, sodium, and water that are passing in and out of the cell. We talked about that a little bit. What is one uh, important but very basic uh, player in the homeostasis of potassium and sodium at the cell membrane of most cells, all cells. 
sodium and potassium, membrane of the cell. What's that? So what what is what is uh, something I've talked? Yeah, say it. Sodium potassium pumps. Yeah, the sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, we talked about that when we talked about muscles and um, and neurons, right? So that's one that's one player. There are leak channels as well, but there there are other uh, more sophisticated mechanisms that we're not going to talk about. All right. So uh, this term, blood pressure homeostatic axes. Uh, the term axis is a term that you are uh, more likely to come across in uh, medical school or in a medical context than you are in a physiology uh, textbook. Although I don't, I don't even remember if the Martini text that I, I gave you guys uh, even uses this term or not. But um, so, what what is an axis? Uh, well. I'll define it for you. It's just a sequential set of various uh, influences or uh, feedback mechanisms that uh, involve uh, a host of endocrine glands and uh, target organs, uh, so an axis. And when we talk about blood pressure homeostasis, uh, there are two main uh, axes. Uh, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. So this is going to be a host of uh, physiological influences and enzymes and hormones and feedback me mechanisms that work in concert uh, in, a, in a direct flow chart stream. And then the hypothalamic-pituitary-adrenal axis. And I've talked about, I mentioned that a couple slides ago. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the RAA axis now before I do. Sometimes you see RAA system, RAAS. Um, before I do that, is there any, anyone foggy on something? Does anyone want to test themselves by explaining to me what I've said so far? No? Okay. All right, so I apologize for the small text on this slide. I should probably remake it. But um, here is, this is the RAA axis. This is how we produce each of the characters in the RAA axis. I'm going to tell you what they do in a subsequent slide. This is just how we get them. All right? Does that make sense? So in this chart, we're going to have some kind of physiological perturbation in green. Uh, enzymes, so the enzymes I talked about were renin and ACE. Uh, they're in blue, uh, renin and the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. And then uh, the various hormones or pre-hormones are in beige. Um, let's, let's start up here with a drop in uh, the renal perfusion pressure. All right, So this is a drop in the glomerular filtration rate. Um, as sensed by the macula densa, as that tubular fluid passes through the distal convoluted tubule up to the juxtaglomerular complex. All right, follow me, recalling that diagram. Uh, so we're just calling it renal perfusion pressure here because that is directly related to glomerular filtration rate. They are slightly different concepts, but they're directly correlated. Um, so that drops, stimulating uh, the release of renin by the juxtaglomerular complex into the bloodstream of uh, the efferent arterial. That renin is then going to pass through the bloodstream. This pro-enzyme, uh, pro-hormone, I shouldn't call it an enzyme, this pro-hormone uh, angiotensinogen. How do I know it's a pro-hormone? How do you know it's a pro-hormone? Just looking at it, and besides the fact that I told you, Come on, cast your minds back. I've told you this before. Did I tell you this already? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's got the gen in the title. Yeah, like the, o, the O gen, the e, O G E N. Yeah, that's right. Genesis, right. So uh, anytime you see some kind of chemical, uh, some sort of biochemical, whether it's an enzyme or a hormone or whatever, that uh, ends like this, has that ending, that means it's like we talked about. Um, Fibrinogen, 
that was, I think, the example where I, I talked about this. Uh, fibrinogen is, uh, not, is not functional as it sits. It's going to have um, a cleavage product. Uh, it's going to get clipped. Part of it's going to, the regulatory peptide is going to be clipped off of it, and it's suddenly going to become active, fibrin. A fibrinogen becomes fibrin and then forms clots. Yeah? So, sorry, renal perfusion pressure uh, activates synthesis of renin, activation of renin, what? Uh, no, yeah. Act, well, does it activate synthesis? It probably does uh, stim stimulate synthesis, but there's renin on deck that gets degranulated into the blood. Okay. Uh, that is that is that is triggered by a drop in the GFR. So uh, renin gets dumped into the bloodstream, and um, and it travels throughout the system, gets to the liver, uh, runs into angiotensinogen there. Angiotensinogen. Uh, so renin is an enzyme, and it is uh, it's a peptidase. It's going to cleave this regulatory bit off of angiotensin and uh, angiotensinogen, and it's going to become angiotensin 1, all right? Angiotensin 1 is now going to circulate through the bloodstream, and uh, in the lungs, there's this enzyme called uh, ACE, angiotensin-converting en uh, enzyme, uh, conveniently uh, entitled, and it, can, it causes uh, a further cleavage uh, to angiotensin 2. Uh, it is angiotensin 2 that is going to do a host of things. It's going to do a host of things, but one of them, so that we can go on and talk about all the characters that are in our play here, uh, one of them is going to travel to uh, uh, the adrenal gland, and the steroid precursors that are produced there uh, are going to be converted by angiotensin 2 uh, into aldosterone. All right. Uh, it's it's not actually angiotensin two that's causing that conversion. It's it's uh, it's a hormone that's causing a signaling cascade in the uh, in the endocrine structures that result in the production of aldosterone. So now what we have is uh, we started with renin. Renin was the trigger, and the result of this is that we've got angiotensin and aldosterone. All right. And we're going to see what these two things do. Yeah. So, sorry, where is the angiotensin 2 meeting? And, it's, and you said that it's not directly causing the steroid... Well, it's not an enzyme. It's no, causing it's a signaling it. cascade oh. that results in the, in the uh, secretion of aldosterone. And, sorry, where is that? Is that the medulla? In a, in, yeah, in an in endocrine structure. I believe it is the medulla. I should double check that. I'm certainly not going to test on that concept. Um, all right. So uh, here is a, an overview of uh, what the RAA axis is doing. Um, and then I'm going to get into more detail. Uh, so just a, another level in here. Uh, again, so this is uh, recapitulating what I've already said. We have uh, a, a drop in the perfusion pressure, renin gets secreted. Uh, we have angiotensinogen. It is uh, a proenzyme that says here 453 amino acids long. Um, angiotensin is only 10 amino acids long. So uh, renin cleaves this big chunk off of angiotensinogen. And angiotensin 1 is, is quite small travels to the lungs, gets converted uh, by ACE into angiotensin 2, uh, has two amino acids clipped off the end of it. And then angiotensin 2 is going to have a host of uh, effects. First of all, it's going to travel to the hypothalamus and feed into uh, the HPA axis that I talked about, all right, uh, and have other cognitive effects as well. So you're going to feel thirsty, and you're going to want to drink. Um, and then there's going to be the, the other effects of the HPAA axis. Uh, angiotensin 2 is also going to result in vasoconstriction. All right? So the thirst, why, why thirsty? Oh, before I jump to vasoconstriction, why, why, 
is that uh, a, a reasonable response to low uh, blood pressure, low filtration rate at the kidneys? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have a lower fluid volume, which is giving rise to the lower blood pressure. So, drink some water. Um, vasoconstriction. So that's one way of helping to raise the blood pressure. Uh, vasoconstriction is going to effectively decrease the volume of the uh, circulatory system and thus also propping up the uh, <coughs> blood pressure. And then there's going to be uh, the effect at the adrenal cortex, where, oh, the cortex, it, it, it's not the medulla, sorry, uh, where uh, the production of aldosterone uh, happens, and that's going to have its effect on the kidney. Um, and so angiotensin II and aldosterone are going to have their effects at the kidney, which uh, result in both sodium and water retention. All three of those uh, prongs are going to lead to an elevated uh, blood pressure. Um, so overall, angiotensin II is going to help restore fluid volume and uh, raise your, your blood pressure. Uh, looking at it in sort of a flow chart form here, uh, we have a decrease in blood pressure at the glomerulus. Why? Uh, maybe there's blood loss. Maybe... Um, yeah, you're, you're dehydrated. Anyways, the blood volume's down or your systemic blood pressure is down for one re reason or another. Perhaps uh, there's some kind of uh, embolus in uh, the kidney. The renal artery is blocked for some reason. Um, and uh, perhaps there is a drop in the osmotic concentration of the tubular fluid at the mac uh, macula densa. There's not uh, the amount of sodium that we're expecting there, or potassium, uh, however, however you want. So uh, we're, we have a decreased GFR. Uh, we're going to release renin. So I've already said this. The, the perfusion rate goes down. GFR goes down. Renin gets released by the juxtaglomerular complex. Uh, that can also be affected by the sympathetic uh, nervous system as well. Uh, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about uh, that, uh, that branch of the three branches for control of the GFR. Renin uh, activates angiotensin, brings uh, blood pressure up, and uh, we lead to increased GFR. All right? So there's an overview of the homeostasis. Uh, the next two slides are probably the meatiest ones in the talk today. Um, so let's look at the actual nephron. Um, first, uh, we, we talked about the effects on afferent and efferent blood supply, right? The, uh, the dilation of the afferent uh, blood vessel and the contraction of the efferent uh, arteriole. All right, and that differential in pressure as uh, being one mechanism for increasing GFR. This tubular fluid, as it passes out uh, into the proximal convoluted tubule, angiotensin II uh, can affect the resorption of uh, sodium and a counter anion, uh, so we have an isotonic uh, of carbonate. Uh, this is under the control of angiotensin Two. And in fact, all mechanisms, if I get to it today, I may not be able to because there's I have more slides than I'll be able to talk about. But um, angiotensin 2, in the proximal convoluted tubule, all uh, mechanisms that happen there are involving uh, sodium in, in one way or another. And this is under the control of angiotensin 2. So then the tubular fluid passes into this loop of Henle uh, in the countercurrent multiplication. Uh, so this, uh, we have a water impermeable uh, descending limb, no, I'm sorry, a water permeable descending limb and a water impermeable ascending limb. In this ascending limb, there is the active transport 
of sodium, uh, chloride, and potassium. So again, isotonic, every uh, two cations, there's two anions getting pumped out. Using ATP, however, to make this happen. And it's not because uh, we're disturbing the electrochemical gradient, right? Because uh, this is a neutral transfer here. It's, it's not the electrical gradient, it's the chemical gradient uh, that we need ATP to work against. So we are increasing. What happens here is that this tissue, the interstitial tissue of uh, the renal medulla, becomes hypertonic. We've pumped, we're pumping a huge amount of sodium uh, and potassium into this tissue. It's becoming hypertonic uh, relative to the tubular fluid. And so what's happening is that's driving the passive uh, osmosis of water out of the descending limb. They call it countercurrent because water's passing, the tubular fluid's passing down here and water's coming out and then tubular fluid's passing up and uh, solutes are actively being pumped out. Uh, and this process is helping drive the removal of water from the tubular fluid. So countercurrent, and it's multiplying the effects. This is actually a gradient as you move uh, through the uh, renal medulla. We'll look at a diagram that goes through that more, hopefully. So the angiotensin, does it diffuse into the... So remind yourself of the diagram I showed of the nephron earlier. Uh, there is, so the efferent arterial comes out of the glomerulus and then goes into this complex uh, peritubular network of capillaries. So all of these tubes are, are richly surrounded with uh, capillaries. And even down here in the juxtaglomerular nephron, there was uh, the... Uh, uh, the juxtamedullary nephron, pardon me, there was the um, vasa recta that were th those thin blood vessels that uh, were going over. So angiotensin is getting di directly delivered via capillary action to that tissue. Uh, this part, the loop of Henle, uh, this, and also in the distal convoluted tubule, the sodium chloride pumps that are there, neither of these uh, are under any known hormonal control. Uh, they, they have not identified any hormone that actually controls those mechanisms, uh, they may not be constitutive, um, but uh, if there are control mechanisms, they have not been identified uh, currently. So then we pass into uh, the collecting duct. And in the collecting duct, there's a couple different types of cells. Uh, there are these principal cells, which you see here. Uh, they are uh, uh, responsible for, again, an isotonic exchange. Uh, of sodium and potassium that is stimulated by aldosterone and then um, further down there are these intercalated cells maybe not further down I guess they they're uh, mixed in with the principal cells uh, is uh, these intercalated cells who um, use a, a proton gradient uh, to drive uh, potassium extraction and this is under uh, the influence of aldosterone uh, as well. Um, so uh, also if you have a drop in potassium uh, in, the, in the bloodstream, that can also be uh, a driver of these intercalated cells. And then finally there's um, the uh, juxtaglomerular cells uh, that are near the afferent and efferent arterioles, uh, and we, we've already talked about that. Uh, those get uh, stimulated um, by beta-1 receptors. All right, so low renal perfusion pressure leads to increased secretion of renin. Again, I'm just repeating, reinforcing. Uh, that leads to the activation of angiotensinogen 2 and the, and the release of aldosterone. Um, aldosterone and angiotensin 2 lead to increased uh, sodium uh, reabsorption and uh, the consequent reabsorption of water and thus increase in blood pressure. Uh, one of the, um, the other effects of this is going to be an 
an increase in the serum pH. You'll notice here uh, when we have aldosterone in these uh, intercalated cells, we're pumping hydrogen ions out into the urine. We're acidifying the urine. Uh, and this has the effect of alkalizing uh, the blood. All right. So this is one of the ways we control the pH of, um, of our blood by actively excreting uh, hydrogen ion in exchange for uh, potassium. All right, so here's, this, this is my most complicated slide, but we can walk through it. Um, we absorb sodium, potassium, and water uh, through the GI tract. It then enters the blood. Follow me through this, this diagram. Um, then sodium, potassium, and water are all filtered out of the blood into the filtrate at the glomerulus. Uh, in the kidney. Then the kidney, uh, through the various actions at the uh, different tubular sites, uh, are going to resorb uh, sodium, potassium, and water back into the blood. Uh, this is under the control of, uh, so the sodium resorption uh, is stimulated by angiotensin and uh, aldosterone. Uh, also, a little bit of action of cortisol although um, uh, that is part of the HPA axis that I'm not going to go into uh, a tremendous amount. Because of the uh, active effect of angiotensin on sodium and aldosterone effect on sodium uh, reabsorption, there's an indirect effect on water reabsorption, right? Because uh, if you're pumping sodium into the interstitium of the, of the kidney, Water is going to follow that, that osmotic gradient. So when we have an increase in angiotensin and aldosterone, there, it's directly affecting the reabsorption of sodium and indirectly causing the reabsorption of water because of that. Does that make sense? That's why there's a dotted line there. Um, ADH is called antidiuretic hormone. I haven't really talked about that uh, much yet. Uh, this is coming through the HPA axis, uh, but it also has a direct effect on uh, water reabsorption. Um, aldosterone has a negative effect on potassium absorption as well. So this is part of the uh, negative uh, feedback uh, mechanism. So we can see that there is a distinction between angiotensin and aldosterone uh, in that regard. Um, this is the intracellular, uh, intracellular space that I talked about earlier uh, in terms of you know, potassium exchange, uh, and that's under the effect of insulin and catecholamines, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about that uh, any more than that. Uh, I will say, though, uh, there's this square here, and this is the other side of the equation. So, so far, everything I've talked about has been about decreasing blood pressure and how to bring the blood pressure back up, right? Um, I haven't talked about how to bring blood pressure down. Well, uh, ANP is atrial natura, uh, naturetic peptide, and BNP stands either for brain naturetic peptide, although it's not actually uh, primarily from the brain. It was just isolated there. It's sometimes called B-type naturetic uh, peptide. Naturetic, that word uh, means when you, naturesis is the elimination of sodium in your urine. So uh, I'm not going to go through that, that whole mechanism in detail because I certainly don't have time for it. But... Um, that's the other half of the equation, all right? So how to eliminate sodium from the body, drawing water with it. So the, one of the take-homes here is water follows sodium, all right? Water follows sodium. That's like a basic principle of chemistry, uh, right? The osmotic gradient. Uh, this AMP and BMP uh, stop uh, the resorption of sodium and indirectly stop the reabsorption of uh, water for the same reason the angiotensin and aldosterone uh, are positively correlated, uh, but indirectly with the reabsorption of water. And I've summarized all this down here. 
uh, angiotensin II uh, leads to an increase in uh, volume, an increase in blood pressure. Aldosterone leads to the same increase in volume and blood pressure, uh, but with lower serum potassium, all right? So it, when you think about aldosterone, the, the uh, relative effects of angiotensin and aldosterone, uh, the trade-off is, uh, is in terms of regulating potassium, okay? Um, and then ADH uh, is, gives you increased volume, increased blood pressure, but ADH is primarily concerned with regulating sodium. The differential with uh, ADH it, between angiotensin and aldosterone is uh, its effect on um, sodium levels in the, the, uh, the, the, the osmotic pressure of sodium in the blood. Okay? All right. So that's, I'm going to keep going, but that is, that was my main aspiration for the day was to cover that slide. So I've, I've pretty much got it. Everything else is um, extra here. Um, so, yeah, this slide is basically uh, saying uh, that, um, again, here is the, the loop of Henle. We see active transport of sodium and chloride, and then the passive transfer of water following that, that chemical gradient, that osmotic gradient uh, that's being est actively established. Um, Antidiuretic hormone um, in uh, the presence of antidiuretic hormone, there are going to be the insertion of what are called aquaporins, uh, these proteins, basically just water channels uh, that get uh, inserted into the uh, into uh, the membranes of the cells lining the uh, the collecting duct and um, uh, con ends up concentrated in the urine. You have a, a, a retention of water. Um, I don't want to go through this at all. The point in, yeah. Oh, uh, did we cover how the water actually gets back into the bloodstream from the medulla? It, it, just, it just gets absorbed into the, in, directly into uh, into the capillaries that are running through the medulla. It's, okay, it's, it's diffusion. Those are the capillaries that are, uh, I guess, perfusing the medulla itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 running all over yeah. the, the... Yeah, they're, they're exactly perfusing that, that tissue. Um, oh, yeah, we got a visitor. Come on in. There's lots of room. Um, so... Uh, this is countercurrent multiplication, and I already I've talked about this a couple times. Perhaps this isn't. Uh, I don't. Is there any? Okay, this is my last concept, and I, I know I'm I'm getting close to the edge here. Uh, is the notion of transport maximum and renal threshold? There are all these transporters that are uh, embedded in the tubes, uh, of the various tubes uh, of uh, the nephron, and these transporters. The, the, the notion is that they're saturatable. If the concentration of some solute goes above the ability of those transporters to pump stuff out of the tubes, uh, out of the tubular fluid, out of the filtrate, uh, then whatever that solute is, is going to then appear in the blood. Here's below transport maximum, here's at transport maximum where that transporter is saturated, and here it is above it, and you see uh, this thing uh, passing into the urine, and, it's, and the, it's the same for resorption. So the important point that I wanted to make with this is uh, glucose has a pretty high transport, uh, a renal threshold, right? So if, you're, if, you're, um, if your blood level of glucose is a, above 180 milligrams per deciliter, which is pretty high, uh, then you're, you're above the renal threshold of uh, the, the, the transport maximum of whatever transporter, and you're going to have uh, glucose appear in your urine. This is the glycosuria that uh, Hippocrates was noticing when he started taking a swig of urine uh, as indicative of diabetes 2. Uh, and 
uh, notice, I just want you to compare this with uh, the amino acid renal threshold, which is significantly lower. Uh, so amino acids are not as critical to uh, you know, your physiology, uh, ba baseline energetic metabolism as, as glucose is. So you have a significantly lower renal threshold for amino acids. That's it. Thank you.